Welcome, everyone. I'm Caroline Crawford, and I'm so pleased to welcome so many new and uh, old faces to Pequot Library's Digital Meet the Author talk. Um, we've really enjoyed some of these virtual programs over the last few weeks, and we're delighted to have you join us this afternoon. Although Pequot Library's historic, beautiful doors are temporary, Pequot Library is still churning and burning, and we have so many programs and important resources for patrons near and far. And we hope you and your friends and your family are able to take uh, advantage of all these great resources. Um, we appreciate everyone's generosity and support over the last, you know, 130 years. And uh, as the fiscal year is coming to an end, we are working on a new appeal and your support and generosity is also greatly appreciated. We can't have amazing opportunities and uh, talks like these without your support and I thank you so much. And uh, when I met Patricia Chadwick in the fall, I had read her book and I thought the book was fantastic. And then walked into the gorgeous auditorium at Pequot Library and she just bedazzled the crowd. I thought I loved her, I read her book, and then I met her in person, and I just thought, what a remarkable woman. Um, you are gonna love her story. If you haven't read the book, you will get a big, uh, delight glimpse this afternoon. Uh, it's a love story. I mean, she has a fantastic history, and I'm so excited that she's back this afternoon to share this love story with Pequot Library, our patrons, our new friends, and uh, Patricia, thank you for being here. We are so happy. Well, thank you, Caroline. I feel really honored to be part of the Meet the Author series. My book, which some of you certainly know about now, um, is called Little Sister, and it's a memoir about growing up in what I have come to be able to say, these two words, a Catholic cult. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I thought that I would start off by reading the short prologue and then uh, give you some background information. And then after questions and answers, if there's time, I'll read uh, the afterword, which is even shorter than the prologue. <clears throat> Until the age of 18, I had never read a newspaper nor perused the pages of a magazine. I had never eaten in a restaurant nor shopped in a grocery store. I had never bought any clothes or cosmetics or a single item that could be called my own. I had never heard of Elvis Presley or Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando or Elizabeth Taylor. I had never watched television nor made a phone call. I did not know how to dance. I grew up in St. Benedict Center, a sequestered Catholic community headed by Leonard Feeney an excommunicated priest, and his spiritual cohort, Catherine Clark, a staunchly Catholic married woman with a strident disposition toward Puritanism. The center, as we called it, first located a short walk from Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and sub subsequently transported to the bucolic hamlet of Still River, Massachusetts evolved into a social experiment of sorts, whose purpose was to create a pure-hearted community in which no material thing, no cultural influence, not even the bonds between family members could impede the path to God. Dedicated to a rigid adherence to Catholic orthodoxy, this community of nearly 100 people, including my parents and 39 children who were born into it, lived a life completely shielded from an outside world that was considered to be fraught with sin and danger. I was educated within the confines of my community from nursery school through my senior year of high school. For much of my childhood, I grew up without the daily love and attention of my parents. I was just six years old when Leonard Feeney and Catherine Clark made the decision that my siblings and I were to live apart from our parents. Later, Leonard Feeney pressured my parents to forsake their marital vows, no longer living as husband and wife. A celibate existence, they were told, was more conducive to a life dedicated to God. 
and so my parents complied. On only one occasion during my life at the center was I allowed to listen to the radio. That was when the community assembled to hear the inaugural address of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the country's first Catholic president. I felt transported at that moment into the vast, unreachable outside world, a place I longed to experience. I was 11 years old at the time. I had heard of the Beatles only because Leonard Feeney had once played a 15 second snippet of their hit song, I Want to Hold Your Hand, as a demonstration of what he called music of the devil. The eruption of rock and roll onto the world stage was lost on me, as was the sexual revolution that came in its wake. Within my community, any personal attachment, any demonstration of familial affection, any expression of romantic love was prohibited. As for sex, the word itself was verboten. There was no explanation of the facts of life, as though by revealing nothing, the course of nature could be manipulated and the lack of knowledge would lead to lack of interest. But the absence of understanding such things did nothing to inhibit my natural interests and desires. As I matured into my teenage years, I fell into a series of crushes on the grown men within the community, with not a glimmer of understanding about why it happened, what it meant, or what to do about it. Though I'd never had a date, much less kissed a boy, my innocent interest was viewed as subverting God's will, which was deemed to be that each of the 39 children should embrace religious life and celibacy. And so just two months before my 18th birthday, I faced expulsion from the community, banished from my home, my parents, my siblings, and the only people I knew and loved. An infant in the ways of modern life, I was being compelled to leave my family behind and make my way alone in a world I'd been taught to believe was full of evil. So let me give you a little more backdrop before we open it up to questions, if, if that's all right. Um, as Caroline said, uh, this is a love story, and it is. What it is not is a mommy dearest story. And there is a way in which I could have produced a mommy dearest story, but that was not the purpose of this uh, book. Uh, it is truly the story about a family that couldn't be broken. And as the reader goes into the book, I really want the reader who is going to go through some dark phases, some uncomfortable periods, to know that in the end, everything works out. And that's why the dedication is to mother and daddy for always letting me know that they loved me. Why did I decide to write the book? I was 55 when I basically said to my parents, I want to write the stories of my childhood. And I said, I look back on my childhood with many, many happy memories. And my parents were hugely supportive of that. This was not a cathartic experience for me. There were a couple of stories in the book that were somehow cathartic in, in finally being able to, to write them. But what I realized was that 50 years from now, there will be no more eyewitnesses to this story. And I felt it was important to get the story out firsthand. It took me 10 years to write the book. So I started at 55 and then I did nothing for five years. I just thought about it, but I didn't even know how to go about it. And by then, when I was uh, 60, my father died and I started to write, but I had to learn the craft of writing. And so I actually went to the Westport Writers Workshop, which some of you may be familiar with, for five or six years. And there was a group of women in my class, and they were enormously helpful because I was still so anxious about writing this story and having everyone hate my parents. And they were wonderful. And they said, we don't hate your parents. We know whom we hate, but it's not your parents. So I was about eight years into the 10 years of writing the book. And I was really down to doing 
the final editing, which took me a very long time to do. I've probably read this book 427 times. It's just, and every time, even when I read it now, I go, oh, why did I choose that word? I should have chosen a different word. But be that as it may, I shared it with my children. I have twins who are now 26 years old, but at the time they were in college. And my daughter came home one weekend from college and she said, mom, I have two things to tell you. First, you need to stop everything until you finish this book. And second, you have to accept the fact that you grew up in a cult. I had never thought about my home, my family, my extended family, my family of 100 people. I had never thought of it as a cult. But I heard her and I listened to her. I didn't change a single thing in the book. I was, we were really, you know, almost through the editing phase by then. Um, and I'm very happy with the benefit of hindsight that I didn't write this book thinking and believing and now knowing <laughs> that I grew up in a cult because I think it would have produced a different product. I think I would have been doing this contrast and compare. Uh, and I just wrote the story. To me, a cult was Jim Jones or the Branch Davidians um, or Charles Manson. But it never struck me that where I grew up was a cult. I see with complete clarity now, and thank you to my 20-year-old daughter who opened my eyes to that, but I, I understand it now and, and completely um, believe that that really was the case. Um, so the book has now been out for about 13 months and the paperback is out. And I have to say that the other really, really important and incredibly rewarding part of having written this book is the responses I have had from the children that I grew up with. And I know we're not children anymore. I'm 71. I was one of the oldest. But of the 39 children, sadly, six have already died. And of the remainder, well, four are my siblings. But at least two thirds of the kids that I grew up with have reached out to me to say, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for you know, airing the story. And there are a couple of people in the audience here today with whom I grew up, and thank you for, for chiming in. Uh, that to me tells me, in my own personal way of thinking, that it was a grace to write the book. And it was a blessing to write it because it has helped the people whom I grew up with, whom I love, whom I still consider to be my brothers and sisters. And uh, what I had not realized until they came and shared their appreciation and their thoughts about it, I had not realized how much they suffered from PTSD. I feel very, very lucky to, to at least on my part believe that I have not suffered from PTSD, but so many of them have. And I think one of the reasons I didn't was I was so aware of my parents' love for me. I would particularly my father, and I have numerous stories in the book of how he broke the rules. And even just by wiggling his little finger at me uh, because he wasn't allowed to speak to me at all, that was the glue that held me together when we would go for months without even being able to say a word to each other. And so, I never felt that PTSD, but I know that the other kids did, or many, many, many of them, and that many of them have been in therapy for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and to have been able to relieve some of their unhappiness, the, the secrecy that was surrounding this place where we grew up, for me, that's, that's truly the best part of, of having written it and shared it with them. So I think that's enough of background. I'm happy to answer any questions. For those of you who are familiar, I don't know whether you're on your, your iPad or perhaps your um, desktop, but if you go to the top or the bottom, depending on which one you are, 
there's participants and there's also something that says more. And if you click on participants for one of them and more on the other, so just try both, it will say that you can um, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, it will get you know, to the library and they will see who you are and they will just tell me that you want to ask a question. Um, because for the most part, I think you're gonna be muted and then they'll unmute you. I hope that's not too complicated. And if you want, just raise your hand like that as well, because I think that um, Jennifer will be just flipping through to keep an eye on everyone um, as well. Patricia, you have a couple of questions already in the chat um, that people sent through while you were speaking, if you wanna start with those. Okay, now you're gonna embarrass me because I'm gonna to have to get, oh, chat, five of them. Um, oh, in, in raising your children, how did you balance your young life with the life you wanted for your children? What did you do that was the same? And what one or two things did you do that were the total opposite? Um, thank you uh, for that question, Brianna. Uh, there were three things that I felt in my being brought up that influenced me in terms of things I would not do with my own children. And for those of you who haven't read the book, um, you will come to realize that there was a huge amount of um, physical abuse. There was not sexual abuse, so that is a very fortunate thing. But uh, the amount, the numbers of beatings that were meted out to people was just appalling. Now I know it was the 50s and the 60s, and that's that's just a myth that people were brought up significantly differently from the way they are today. But when it, I came around to having children or even wanting them and thinking about raising children, I thought to myself, I can't understand why anyone would ever have to beat a child. So, and my husband is on this thing too. The two of us um, raised our children and we have never, never hit them. And they are fabulous children today. So there was certainly no need ever to do that. Uh, the other thing that was, it was kind of um, funny in a way, but uh, you'll read in the story that one of my sisters, my sister Kathy, was hugely negatively impacted by the separation from our parents. Just, it was horrific for her. I, I managed through better than she did. And she would go for days on end without eating. And she would always be punished for not eating, which would just tear me apart because I, I kept thinking to myself, she's going to die. Why doesn't someone help her and find out what her problem is? And whenever I could, I would you know, eat her food for her so that she wouldn't get into trouble. Uh, so I decided as a parent that, you know, issue, there was never going to be a fight about food. There was never going to be a, an issue about food. There was never going to be, you have to eat some green vegetables. And I did um, apply that. And my husband can guarantee, even to this day, <laughs> sometimes, Fortunately, my children now have wonderfully diverse appetites, but our son was a picky eater. And I just said, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna make an issue. So every day it was, what would you like for dinner? 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 Very often we had four different dinners on the dinner table. Now I'm not sure that I would recommend that to everyone, but in my case, it was a complete reaction um, to what, to what had happened in my growing up. And the third thing, which again, it always seemed to me when I was growing up that the answer was no, if you wanted something, unless it was you know, a holy book, a book of the saints, but it was, the answer was always no. And so I was very conscious, conscious with our own children. You know, you can't say yes to everything, we know that. And so it was just my, my endeavor, if I had to say no, which was frequently, to try to have at least a door opener to a way in which yes might come some point down the road. So I hope that that was helpful. I'll go back to the, the, the chat. Um, do you know people who spent time in other cults? Well, since I didn't even 
think I was in a cult. I never really thought about it. And I haven't made any effort to meet people or to engage people in other cults. I have listened or read some stories about others, but I do not know another person um, who, you know, I have not made that connection, nor do I particularly want to, because I am sure each cult has, is very different, but there are enormous similarities and we know what some of those similarities are and they have to do with, you know, segregation and power and, and, you know, obedience and all these other things. And I now see that in my own, in the center, um, but I haven't done any further research. I just, I just see the, the signs of it. Oh, where can people purchase the book? Well, you can certainly go on Amazon. I, I would say go to your local bookstore because I always like to support the local bookstore, but unfortunately these days I'm not sure you can, you can get in. I have a website, which is simply patriciachadwick.com, which has a lot of interviews and a lot of things like that, but it also has a link right to Amazon, but it is definitely an, on Amazon and the uh, paperback is now. It's also got an audio version and a Kindle version. How do you feel about the Catholic Church now? I am Catholic. I might be the most liberal Catholic that I know. Um, but for me, the, the issues are not about Catholicism. This was Catholicism gone awry. This was a group of people who, from my standpoint, were not living the life of the gospel. We're not. I mean, we were excommunicated, um, but ultimately they lived a life that was, you know, Catholic for sure. And, you know, I, for me, the fact that there are some people within any religion, any government, any corporation that might um, abuse their situation doesn't, in my mind, make me throw the baby with, out with the bathwater. So I, I find it very comfortable, very, um, I really love uh, Catholicism. Uh, it is the first Christian religion. I've said to my husband, who's Episcopalian, that, you know, the only reason he's, he's got a religion at all is because the founder wanted a new wife. And that, you know, otherwise he'd still be Catholic. So um, I, am, I am Catholic. I am a very open-minded Catholic. I, I go to synagogues. I go to mosques. I have, well, I was actually the, the woman, I don't know the precise word for it, um, and at a bar mitzvah for one of my children's closest friends. So I stood up there in the synagogue and wrote, had a speech that I uh, read to the, to the young man who was, who was making his bar mitzvah. So I'm very, very open-minded. I love uh, Orthodox churches, Lutheran churches. So I'm, a, I'm a, a Catholic with a lot of open heart for a lot of other religions. Is there another one that I should be finding there? I don't think do so, you want... but Freya, you have a question? Yeah. Can you hear me? I now can, yes, Freya. Okay. Um, Patricia, I read your book quite a few months ago, and one of the one of the uh, periods of time that you described that I found just riveting was when you first came out into the world all by yourself, facing a culture you'd never seen before. I mean, you talked about music and movies, but I think it's hard for any of us to imagine that complete lack of exposure to everything that everyone took for granted. It's much worse than being in a country and not knowing the language. It's being in a country and not knowing the culture. And I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit on that period and maybe say a few things about um, how it felt and how you came to comprehend, you know, that great complexity that had been going on without you. <laughs> that's, Freya, thank you for that. That's, that's a wonderful lead into something that um, I enjoy talking about. When I left 
the center. I did not know the language of the world. I had never heard a swear word in my life. I had never even heard a slang word. So I, I didn't know a single tennis player, baseball player, movie actor. Uh, one day I was on a bus when I was you know, going in to go to secretarial school and a man sitting next to me whom I would, I would not speak to a single person on the bus because we were brought up that you do not ever just you know, meet someone and speak to them. You have to be properly introduced. <laughs> So this man turned to me and said, has anyone ever told you you look like Lauren Bacall? I had never heard of Lauren Bacall. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I just, you know, quietly turned away my back toward him and looked out the window. And, you know, sometime later, I asked my mother, who was still Sister Elizabeth Ann up there in Snow River, I said, who is Lauren Bacall? And she said, oh, darling, she was a beautiful actress and very talented, blah, 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 blah. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, I, uh, I mean, I had no idea whether I was pretty, whether I was ugly. I frankly had no idea whether I was dumb or I was smart. You know, there was nothing that was ever uh, kind of discussed with us or allowed with us that would give us any sense of personal um, confidence or personal pride. Uh, we were just in these outfits that certainly didn't do anything to enhance um, one's you know, shape. Not that I had much at the age of 18, but uh, you know, I was completely oblivious. And it was uh, 20 years later when I, I was out in East Hampton and there was a fundraiser, which I believe was for the fire department. And we had these great big picnic tables, but we were, it was black tie and it was really fun. And I was sitting at the picnic table and across the table from me was a man I didn't know at all. And he leaned over the table and said to me, has anyone ever told you, you look like Lauren Bacall? <laughs> and it was like, oh my gosh, I knew at that point to be appreciative and, and to be flattered. But I truly left the center with eyes wide open, ears wide open, and mouth shut as hard as it could be because I was afraid of anything I said. And if anyone brought up, you know, we'd even say, oh, where did you grow up? I, I mean, I'd practically throw up and run into the bathroom. I just, I, you know, we were associated, you know, the Feniites was what we were called. So in the Boston area, which was where I was, in the Boston area, if you were a Feniite, you were the most despised person in the world. So I couldn't let anyone ever know um, that I was that I was a Feniite. I will actually tell you an, a, another story, which is in my, I am actually doing another book, uh, writing another book, which is about, frankly, growing up on Wall Street, because my first job was as a receptionist on Wall Street. And if I had not had, I don't say Wall Street, because it was Boston, but it was at a brokerage firm. And if I had not had that job as a receptionist, I would never have ended up on Wall Street. It was a, you know, step by step by step by step. But uh, there was, um, when I was in the secretarial school, this story will be in my second book, but I, I have, I'll have, i share it with you now. I, there was a word that people kept using. Everybody in the school, every girl in the school was using the word, and I had no idea what it meant. I looked it up in the dictionary, and I, couldn't find it. And I thought, how am I ever going to find out what this word means? And so there were some, there was an array of types of girls. But there was one girl that I liked because she was very, to me, very Catholic. She went to Arlington Catholic and she had beautiful manners and she was very ladylike. And I thought, okay, maybe she's a safe person to ask this question to. So one afternoon as we were leaving the school, and the interesting thing is, unless it comes back to me, I can't remember her name anymore, but I can see her so clearly. And I said to her, could you help me with something? And she said, sure. I said, could you tell me what shit means? <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, shit. 
And I thought, that's it. Never asking another question in my entire life. And, you know, that just shut me up even more. So uh, it, it, was, it was really difficult up front. But I, you know, I was hell-bent to learn. And I did. And little by little, I started talking and, you know, having conversations where I didn't feel as though I had to run out of the room. Um, but I never, never, never told my, told my story to anyone. I, when I started to write my book at the age of 60, I had now had my Wall Street career. Um, and I took my children up to Still River all the time because, you know, after Sister Catherine died, I, you know, became very, very friendly with them again, very supportive of them. And at one point when my daughter was about nine, she said, Mom, I think I would like to go to boarding school up there in Still River. And I said, no, darling, I don't think you would like to go to boarding school up there. <laughs> but I, you know, it basically, I, um, it, it just took time and it, it, it came around, but it was, it was a long time. And when, as I say, when I started the book, my book, I had only told three people. I went through my entire Wall Street career without ever, ever, ever letting on. But once I had got my, my undergraduate degree from Boston University, which took nine years, well, then I was, there was kind of a more equal playing field. And by then, my family had all left. And so I could treat them in a way that was fairly normal. And once my parents left, they were the most social, the most engaging, the most generous, uh, fun-loving couple in the whole world, and they were absolutely the mother and father to many of the other children who were coming out of the center, whose parents either had split up or the, didn't, they didn't have the same kind of environment, and they would host parties and everything, and they were, they were, they were saints for, for the, what they did. I hope that's helpful. Does anybody else have a question? Oh, Margie Irish, yes. If you were able to crawl into the minds of Father Feeney and Sister Catherine, what would they think about the idea of it being a cult? Oh my gosh. That would be the, they would never, never, never accept that. Let me assure you that there are two, there are two remaining um organizations well there were actually seven or eight organizations but after sister Catherine died and there was a split up uh for me i mean i never used the word cult and even if i could have i probably wouldn't have because this is my family this was my family and they are still dear to me now most of the grown-ups have all died but Sister Catherine and Father saw themselves as leading a small cadre of adults and children dedicated to the dogma of the Catholic Church, which is a dogma the Catholic Church has espoused for centuries, though it doesn't, in general, you know, tout it anymore, that you had to be Catholic to get to heaven. Well, we know lots of religions that do that. But that was the raison d'etre of the center. And that um, was why, as we were told as children, we were the luckiest 39 children in the whole world because we have been dedicated to God from our birth. My father would, you know, once my parents left, there was no, there was no anger expressed towards them. I must say, I'm sure in large measure, it was because there was always this sense that they were supporting us and that they at them and that they loved us but after um you know even they i don't think would necessarily have thought about it as a cult but my father did tell me that each change that was foisted upon them he and my mother would talk about shall we do this shall we you know leave and they felt that they were willing to make these sacrifices because they felt we were getting the purest Catholic education. I mean, my father allowed himself to be fired from Boston College 
for the sake of this one dogma. And my mother, who was born and bred as Episcopalian and converted to Catholicism when she was 18 years old, was probably more Catholic than the Pope. She was so dedicated. Um, but my dad said that after a while, he said it was like a snowball. And each turn at the beginning, you accepted it and you accepted it. And pretty soon he said he got to a place where you couldn't move the snowball anymore. And that's when he was stuck. I, I can, I can, he never said it in a, in a manner of being anger, angry. He, he just accepted the fact that he got roped in. And if you think about the fact that he was, you know, teaching philosophy and mathematics at Boston College in 1949. Ten years later, we moved to Still River. A year and a half after that, he and my mother are talking about, let's, let's leave. We'll just get up one night, we'll take a car, we'll put all five children in the car, and we're simply going to go. But can you imagine? It's now been 12 years where he hasn't been teaching, he hasn't been publishing. He's, Sister Catherine, deliberately took all the great intellectuals, and there were so many PhDs and you know, people who were incredible education, and she had them all doing the menial job. So my father was fixing the cars. Bakri Malouf, who had a PhD in philosophy, he did the laundry. Now Charlie Iwaskio, PhD in physics, he made the, the clothing for everybody. This is the cultish part of it. This is the manipulation. So what was my father going to do in 1960, when he's like 44 years old, with a wife and five children, the youngest of whom was six? He was stuck. I can see exactly why it became impossible for him to leave. That being said, I never ever ended up discussing with him or my mother whether they thought or felt it was a cult. And that wasn't even kind of on the radar. I mean, it wasn't on the radar for me for the whole time I wrote my book till my daughter told me I had to open up my eyes, and I have. Um, is, that, is that helpful, Margie? Thank you. Oh, sorry, Margie. Yes. I've, I've got another one. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just out of curiosity, did Humphrey Bogart or John Chadwick think you looked like Lauren Bacall? <laughs> <laughs> I have had people say, oh, there is definitely a resemblance. I'm not sure anymore with everything that's going on. But um, I, I mean, I, I, can, I can see the cheekbones and stuff. I don't know, darling. Do you think I look like Lauren what, Bacall? Or what do you think much better? I better. <laughs> I would say that there are other women that you remind me of more than than Lauren Bacall. <laughs> okay, I, you don't have to li li list the long list if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. But <laughs> she, yeah. she was she was not high on my list in those days. Oh, all right. I thought she was pretty beautiful. But uh, you didn't remind me of my mother either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Patricia, you have another great question in the chat, which is what led you to create the Anchor Health Initiative, a healthcare company that serves the needs of the LGBTQ community in Connecticut? Well, you know, as so many things happen in life, things happen by accident. And a friend of mine um, asked me if, because I had a finance background, if I would um, come on the board of a different company that did a similar kind of thing. And uh, I said, sure. And pretty soon I found myself being the treasurer and you know, creating the budget and all of that. And there came a point where I, I decided that that was not the right company for me to be with. I mean, this was, this was totally, um, you know, a volunteer position. And so um, the person that invited me and I both left the company. And I had this absolutely cockamamie idea that we could replicate the other company and, and, and do the same thing. And there was one doctor who was very involved that I, I thought the world of. And uh, she's a trans woman. 
And so I said, let's do it ourselves. Good God, I must have been lost my marbles. So four years later, uh, we are probably the largest um, or the most, you know, in Connecticut. We are the place to go for transgender people, which is just an extraordinary thing because of all the people in the LGBTQ community, they probably have some of the worst stigma and some of the worst violence against them and all of that. And so we have, you know, 1,400 patients or so now. We have two offices and one in Hamden and one in Stanford. And uh, it is a, a volunteer position on my part that takes sometimes 30, 40 hours a week. But I, I can see the good that has been done. And uh, it's just now part of my life. But I, I, I think between that I, and, and the fact that mentoring uh, has become an important part of my life, I think these are just ways in which I try to reach out to community. And it was something that we didn't do at the center. And I think I've found my calling in trying to be helpful to people that um, struggle in life. I, I was the one who asked that question. And one of the reasons I asked is because um, my son is gay and I had him in a Catholic school and at a certain point that was not going to be possible with the teachings there. And I wondered if serving on, uh, serving a company um, for LGBT individuals was uh, easily reconciled with your Catholic beliefs or your, um, your family who I s maybe am assuming wrongly are also Catholic. Yes, I would say that um, most of my family, my husband's not, and my, and my children are not. Um, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't contradict it at all. I mean, I look at, at uh, you know, what this Pope says. I adore this Pope. And, Me too. Yeah, uh, what, how he speaks. I mean, who are we to judge? And I'll tell you a lovely story about my father, because I do believe my father, to his dying day, believed that there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. He believed that that was right for him. But when he left the center, he became really, really close friends with a Jewish man. He worked for Volvo. I mean, he could never get a teaching position again. And he said, well, at least I work for a company who's, you know, it's intellectuals that buy the car. So he would have the greatest time with all his, his customers. And this Jewish man became a really lovely friend of his. And I remember towards the end of daddy's life. So he died when he was just a few months shy of 90. Um, and we were talking about some of these issues, not so much heaven and who goes to heaven, but he made the comment, and I could see that this was part of his true belief system. He said, I am not the judge. It is not for me to judge others. That is for God to do. And I thought that was a really wonderful, uh, it was wonderful to hear him say that because we grew up in an environment that was unbelievably judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe throughout that whole period, he didn't really um, believe that the tack that they took was the right one. For him himself, he knew he needed to be Catholic, but he was not going to judge anyone else. So uh, for, I, I mean, as I say, this Pope, as from the very beginning of his papacy has basically been unjudgmental. You look at Mother Teresa, you look at the way the Catholic Church, and I have you know, become very close to the, to the Jesuits that run uh, America Media, America Magazine, America TV, which has just been a, you know, the Jesuits brand for, I don't know, 125 years or something. And I love the Jesuits because they are intellectual and open-minded and non-judgmental. So I think that there are so many ways in which uh, it is easy to be Catholic and be supportive of the LGBTQ community and, and lots of other people that the, that the Catholic Church has historically has uh, probably castigated. But the fact of the matter is God made us all. So who are we to judge is the way I think about it. I believe that too. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Kovner has a question for you. Michael, on, Michael, unmute yourself. 
Oh, hold on one second, sir. We'll get you unmuted. There you go. Am I unmuted now? We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Patricia. Hello, Michael. How are you? That's I'm great. Sure. Anyway, great to hear you. And John's right behind me, as you can see on the wall. <laughs> Anyway, you know, when I first, you know, when you think, talking about unjudgmental, I didn't know you at all. I was sent to a music festival when it was 15 years ago. And I thought, this girl, my God, you were surrounded by men. And they were all gay men. I said, my God, she's the most popular girl. And often you've only been the only girl in a, in a group of people. I don't know who these people are of men, you know, fun and everything like that. So it was natural that you and John did this wonderful thing together in the Anchor Health Management, you with your brains and money. And, uh, but I just, as you know, I've always been horrified at your, when you told me a little bit about, you know, how you grew up, I said, oh my God, you're a Mormon. And I said, no, no. And it's, it's, <laughs> I, I'm not being judgmental, but my God, you are just unbelievable to forgive all those people. You know, I want to, I want to beat that sister Catherine. I really do. I just think that's just, what. I, how could people treat children like that? That I don't understand. I don't understand how you can be so kind about it i really mean it i just don't understand it i mean it's very good good way to be it's better than like maybe being angry at them but holy mackerel is all i could say you know well i will say um that i have thought i mean sometimes i i now that i really do see the cultish um behavior i i can i can get really dismayed by it but i if sister Catherine were alive today or if i were to meet her somewhere I would want to say to her, did something horrific happen to you when you were a child? It's hard for me to fathom how somebody could be so tyrannical and so, I mean, it really, as my mother said, I think she hated sex. I mean, this is a woman who told my mother that her, that her wedding night was the worst night of her life. And immediately asked her husband to take a vow of celibacy with her like they're married two days and then adopts two children so there was some definitely um you know psychological challenges that she had and i certainly just hope and pray it wasn't because something you know horrific happened to her but my mother i think saw her in that particular light i mean why would you suddenly force people and my parents when my when father feeney came to them to suggest that they would lead a celibate life my father said absolutely not but the incredible thing is there were 12 married couples and he you know divided and conquered and pretty soon he came to my parents and said you've got to understand you're the only couple that hasn't agreed and my parents i said to them at one point this is many years later did you think you would have to leave if you didn't do it? And they said, yes. Well, come to find out, they, the Father Feeney pulled the same trick with other parents. And so, so the divide and conquer thing, which can be very much you know, an example of a cult, they just um, didn't have the opportunity to talk to each other about it. They, if they had, they would have all got together and said, okay, this is ridiculous. We are going to leave, lead our lives. And my mother said she would have been very, very happy if they could have remained as a family and who knows how many children they would have ended up with. Um, but if they could have remained, you know, as a family unit, but, you know, going to mass together every day, eating all our meals together, studying together, et cetera, et cetera, being away from the world. That part didn't bother her, but losing her children really was, you know, she, that tore her up. And she said the worst day of her life was the day that the three oldest of us were, were not able to live with them anymore. It's amazing that you forgive them. Well, I was never angry with them. I always <laughs> felt we were in this together. I always felt that uh, that it was Father and Sister Catherine who were pulling all the strings. And believe me, I used to live in fear that they would kick my parents out. And then I wouldn't see them at all. And then I would have to be worried and take care of my, of my siblings. So it was best 
to have them around as far as, as, as I was concerned. And I want to say, I mean, there are things that I look back with such immense pleasure on in my childhood. And I, I, I have to tell you, even in this coronavirus, I'm a very early riser. And I, uh, I'll get up and at 5.30, John can say yes, this is true, I'll go downstairs to the kitchen and just wipe all the countertops so that everything is, is clear. Then I'll do all the laundry, things that I, you know, because we've been paying our housekeeper not to come. And I feel this sense of kind of monasticism when I'm doing it. I feel as though I can hear Gregorian chant in the back of my head. And I just love that silence. I mean, we led a life of silence and silence is golden for me. Every year in the fall, I can three or four bushels of apples and pears. That was what we did up there. And it puts me back in such a wonderful place um, with just the memories of that, that life, which was in many ways, bucolic and beautiful and you know and once you get used to life you know you uh, you become used to having not talking to your parents and so you stop thinking every day well maybe it will change tomorrow it won't change tomorrow so you get on with your life that's unbelievable it's like being in boarding school <laughs> oh well <laughs> you never see your parents <laughs> you just have your friends Oh my God! I, mean, I don't know um, if there, you know, if there aren't um, too many more questions. I would love to read the afterword of my book because, for me, I think it helps to put in perspective how I how I think about it um, today. Is that okay, um, Caroline and Jennifer? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Friends have asked me why I'm not angry why I don't hate my parents, why I seem so normal. Not sure that's true. To be honest, I have spent little time analyzing why I'm happy. That is not to imply that I have been free of any anger. Rather, that the anger I have felt has been directed not at my parents, but at Catherine Clark. From an early age, I had a subliminal conviction that my parents were somehow victims of the powerful Leonard Feeney and Catherine Clark. It appeared to me that my parents, my siblings and I were thrust together in a world that was foreign to our kinship. With the benefit of adulthood and maturity, I came to realize that my parents were free to have left the center and thus to have prevented our family from being sundered. They allowed their religious zealotry to supersede their parental obligations and the joys associated with them. When I tried to understand why my parents did what they did, I cannot. I could never have made such a sacrifice, nor do I pretend that I didn't wish my childhood had been different. Those endless hours consumed craving family life, wondering if we were the only 39 children in the whole world who were being raised in a religious order, forbidden to call our parents mummy and daddy. This incomprehension is real, as is the pain. What anger I have experienced is aimed fully at Catherine Clark, a power behind the throne of Leonard Feeney. Tall and powerful, she exuded an Amazonian force. As a mere child, I was her challenge, unmalleable, a free spirit in the claustrophobic world of the center. She and I engaged in a battle of the wills, and try as she might, she was unable to forge me into a submissive member of the community. And so she banished me. At the time, I felt like a failure. But in truth, it was she who had failed. I was David to her Goliath. Despite the pain and the anger, I am most conscious of the many ways in which I have been blessed. Not the least of which is that I am hardwired to tackle challenges, disappointments, humiliations, and other hurdles in life. I'm an optimist through and through. No matter how bad the news or how daunting the situation, my instinct is to create a solution and see it through to make the situation right again. I left the center at the tender age of 17, brokenhearted and feeling deserted. But that door through which I was kicked out 
was the same door that opened onto a world I had so passionately wanted to explore since I was a small child. The optimist in me seized the opportunity to learn, silently and timidly at first, and to vault forward on the expedition of my life. Some ventures were formidable, but the journey has been extraordinarily fulfilling. There simply has been no time for self-pity. If I let myself dwell on the emotional pain I experienced, I would unfairly ignore all the good that God's grace has showered on me, not the least of which is the blessing associated with raising my own children in a warm and loving family environment. Happiness is finding peace, joy, and inspiration in the array of things one does in life. It is also moving on from what cannot be undone. I am thankful for the grace that allowed me to find a way forward uninhibited by remorse and anger. And that's truly the way I feel right now. It's, I feel so, so, so charmed and blessed and lucky. And I am writing a second book. I hope I will get it finished by the end of this year. And it's going to be funny and it's going to be mad and zany, I imagine, because I grew up on Wall Street. But I will tell you, I grew up on Wall Street when there were no women in positions other than secretary and receptionist. And I had some of the world's best mentors. And I, I respect, and they were all men. They were all men. And Ralph, you were among them. And, uh, and you know what? I, I am enormously grateful. I didn't always realize that they were mentors at the time. But this is, I think, why I'm so engaged in mentoring today. Because I have young women, you know, coming out of college to me and saying, oh, I can't find a woman to mentor me. And I say, don't choose your mentor. Mentoring comes together because you're seeking something and someone else is generous with their time. And that's what makes mentoring work. And you'll have different mentors and some will be for short periods of time and some will go on for long periods of time. And there's no limit to the number of mentors you can have. And, and for me, I am just so appreciative of the time and the, you know, just the being there, the answering of the questions, or, you know, discussing things that would open my mind to other things. And so um, I think that it's, it's, you know, has there been a glass ceiling? Of course there's been a glass ceiling of sorts, but you know what? Every time there's a glass ceiling, my attitude is, there's a door somewhere around here. I'll go out that door, go around the other side and get up even higher. And you can do it. Now, you know, I realize it's not always easy for everyone. And I think I'm lucky that I have a lot of energy and stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is, um, it, I, I am appreciative to so many men who helped me get to where I was. So I think we probably... Whoops. Patricia, Patricia yes. we are thankful on behalf of Pequot Library. I just want to say thanks. What an enchanting and interesting afternoon. We thank everyone for joining us. If you have well, thank you all. I see read so the book, go out and get it ASAP. It's fabulous. And we hope you'll come back with your next book to Pequot Library. Thank you. Liz Lancaster, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate that. I mean, I should name you all. It's, it's just great. Um, but thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. A pleasure. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.